so. All right, if you'll uh, grab your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. My name's Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute. And uh, on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to this. I think it's our, our sixth annual um, uh, legislative preview discussion with our local legislators from the Ninth Legislative District, which, of course, includes WSU. Um, we have with us today uh, Senator Mark Schessler from Ritzville, Representative Joe Schmick from Colfax, and Representative Susan Fagan from Pullman. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. But before I do, I think it's important to lay out uh, and, and discuss why this session, I think, is going to be one of the most contentious and most interesting in, in many years. Uh, among the contentious issues the legislature is going to have to deal with uh, is a passage of a transportation uh, package that has become a perennial problem, it seems, in the state legislature, but also a number of important environmental issues, including uh, the governor's proposal for some kind of a uh, program to reduce carbon emissions, either through a cap-and-trade program or some kind of a carbon tax. But without question, the most controversial issue is going to be pass passage of a, uh, of a biennial budget. Um, the, the good news on the budget front is that recent um, – uh, projections indicate that we'll have the state will have about 2.8 billion dollars in new revenues as a result of the economic recovery. The bad news is that almost all of that will be taken up through uh, maintenance of ongoing programs, and and uh, will have the state legislature will have to come up with somewhere around four billion dollars in new money to spend in order to fund, in particular, uh, needs in basic education. So uh, before I turn the time over to our legislators, I thought I'd just take a minute and show you a couple of slides to give you some context about the budget. And these are figures taken from uh, the Office of Financial Management. This indicates the, the nature of the gap in the budget. So the top line there indicates the new projected revenues, about $2.8 billion. The bottom line indicates the needs in the budget. And you'll see that sort of the maintenance of ongoing programs and uh, some, uh, some, uh, some room there for uh, raises for uh, uh, primary educators, and then also the negotiation for raises for uh, other state employees takes up almost all of that new revenue. Uh, the real need comes right here. The McCleary decision is a Supreme Court decision that requires the state legislature to allocate more funds for uh, uh, basic education. That's projected to cost about $1.2 billion. And then voters just approved Initiative 1351, which requires the state to reduce class sizes and will require the hiring of thousands of new teachers across the state. And that's projected to cost about $2 billion. So that's the nature of the problem the legislature faces in terms of the budget. Of course, they can make up this gap in one of two ways. One way is to do it through uh, cutting, cutting programs and finding more budget cuts. The problem with that, of course, is this indicates the budget right here. About two-thirds of the budget is what we call non-discretionary, meaning it's required by either federal or state uh, statutes. Only about one-third of the budget the legislature has discretionary control over, and you can see higher education is part of that. In fact, it's a large part of the discretionary budget, which is one of the reasons why higher education has had fairly large cuts uh, since the recession. This other chart here shows you of what's happened since the recession in terms of which programs have received budget increases and which ones have received budget cuts. You'll notice the mandatory spending programs like basic education and Medicare have all received new, new funds. But uh, many of these discretionary programs, including higher education, financial services, um, uh, some social service programs, have had very uh, substantial cuts since 2008. The other way to make up the budget gap is through new revenues. Uh, this indicates right here that there may be room for new revenue increases or tax increases. This shows you the percentage of the economy taken up by state and local taxes. It's at its lowest level for uh, several decades now. It's about 5% and on a decline. The problem, of course, with that is if you look at – and if you look at actually our per capita state uh, – uh, rate of uh, state and local taxes, we're just below the national average. But one of the problems with raising taxes in the state of Washington is unlike many other states, we don't have an income tax. 
So to raise taxes, you're going to have to increase perhaps a very regressive sales tax or uh, put more onerous taxes on businesses, which is sometimes economically non-productive. The other problem, of course, is the political one. Uh, tax increases remain very unpopular in the state of Washington. Uh, last year, the state rejected the so-called soda pop tax that legislature had passed. Uh, before that, they rejected an income tax that was on an initiative, uh, even one that was targeted to the highest income earners in, in the state. So one final slide I'll show, since uh, this is a, an audience that's keenly interested in higher education. Uh, higher ed, as I, sh I showed you earlier, is one part of the discretionary budget. It's basically about a third of the discretionary budget, which is one of the reasons why it had disproportionately heavy cuts during the recession. Washington's not alone in uh, massive cuts to higher education over the last five to six years. Uh, it's in about the top third in terms of how much it has reduced uh, funding for higher education. And this chart here shows you the impact of that. The top line here, and this is actually uh, uh, data for the University of Washington, but it's almost identical for Washington State University. This top line here indicates the uh, amount of funding per student at our state universities, and that's remained relatively the same for the last two decades, right around 16 and a half to $17,000. The two bottom lines indicates, though, uh, who bears the burden of that cost. And you can see that prior to the, session, uh, or the recession, about two-thirds of that cost was picked up by the state of Washington and one-third by students and their families in terms of tuition dollars. And that has completely flip-flopped since 2008. So that today, about one-third is paid by the state and about two-thirds paid by students and their families. So. Uh, one of the issues the state legislature is going to have to deal with is right now there's a tuition freeze that has been imposed on the state universities. Whether or not they want to lift that tuition freeze, uh, I, I noted that President Floyd has already indicated that he's not opposed to what he calls a modest increase in tuition. Uh, but of course, student uh, groups, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, are uh, opposed to seeing tuition go up any further. So that is the nature of the budget problem confronting our state legislature. Uh, things have been made a little bit worse by voters in the state of Washington in November because they elected a Republican-controlled Senate and a Democratic-controlled House. So we also have divided government to contend with, and that will probably make compromises more difficult to obtain. We have with us uh, today to speak about this Senator Mark Schessler. Uh, Senator Schessler is a fifth-generation wheat farmer from Ritzville and works uh, the land that his family has owned since the 1880s. He was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1993 where he served for 12 years. He was then elected to the state Senate in 2004, and he was just selected by his colleagues to be the new Senate Majority Leader in the upcoming session. In addition, Senator Sessler also serves on the Agriculture and Water Committee, as well as the Rules Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. Following Senator Schessler, uh, we'll have uh, Representative Joe Schmick uh, speak. He is a graduate of East Eastern Washington University and resides in Colfax, where he is a second generation farmer and a small business owner. Originally appointed to his seat in 2007, Representative Schmick was re-elected this past November in an uncontested race. Representative Schmick is the ranking member of the House Health Care and Wellness Committee, and he serves on the Agriculture and Natural Resources and the Appropriations Committees. And then finally, we'll have a Representative Susan Fagan. She is a graduate of Lewis and Clark State College and a Public Affairs and Government Relations Specialist. She is a former U.S. Senate staff member and political community leader. She was originally elected to her seat in a special session in 2009 and was re-elected this past November running unopposed. Representative Fagan serves on the Appropriations Committee, the Rules Committee, and the Committee for Early uh, Learning and Human Services. So without any further ado, I'll turn the time over to Senator Shester. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to do is take credit uh, give credit where credit is due. Uh, we have a lot of WSU students that come and serve as interns. My intern from last session, Stephanie DeHart is back there. Smile, wave, Stephanie. Uh, st she's going to be working in the Senate this session for uh, Senator Becker, who's the health care chair. Uh, I think it's going to be a great fit for Senator Becker and, and for Stephanie. Uh, those of you who are interested may want to consider the internship program uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's some great experience uh, whether you ever enter public service or not. So 
I would I would encourage you to think about that opportunity. We'd rather have more Cougs and fewer from the other institutions of learning. Uh, the budget clearly is a forefront, but take you back a little bit. You know, two years ago we formed a majority coalition in the Senate that we were going to do things differently. And we faced a budget deficit that was seemed uh, insurmountable to many. We passed a budget with uh, bipartisan first time through, 43 votes through on the final budget in a body that was 25-24. So divided government can and does work in this state. This past year, we passed a supplemental budget 48 to 1. So if you're worried about divided government, uh, that this is the same as the other Washington, don't believe it for a second. Uh, I've known Senator Hargrove, who's the ranking Democrat on the Ways and Means Committee, for over 22 years. Uh, there are ways to get things done. So uh, I'm honored that my colleagues chose me to be the next majority leader. Uh, Pleased that the voters liked what the Senate was doing well enough. They rewarded us in the 2013 special and 2014 elections. But getting on to the budget, like I said, it's a perennial. I mean, I just don't really remember too many budgets in 22 years that didn't have a deficit going in. It's almost like Groundhog Day, folks. I mean, it's just the size of it or whether it came from a recession, from uh, voter past initiatives, but it's kind of a perennial. And I like to think that, uh, as I told the Association of Washington Business last week, the glass is half full. Uh, we've got $2.8 billion more money to spend. Every single month since we wrote the budget, actual cash collections have increased above projections. Pretty consistent trend line we're on. Uh, the wannabe economist in me says that Low gas prices and holiday shopping are probably a good thing. Uh, I noticed since the Apple Cup, gas has gone down about 25 cents in town. Uh, that's certainly going to put a little more Christmas cheer into Pullman in the coming year. Uh, so I, I think that uh, going through the slides, uh, OFM works for the governor. They're, they're not, a, not like the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, they do work for the governor, and they do have a predetermined outcome of what they would like to see in a budget, uh, which may be different than what we or the state as a whole wants as a budget. And clearly you, you evolved to the McClary decision as one of the big drivers in this. Well, the minimum payment, as I understand it, is actually only about $750 million. That's on top of just over around a billion dollars we put in in new and real money last biennium. Uh, first time that trend line in education versus general government has changed in 30 years. It took us 30 years of uh, that growth that what we did, we slowed the rate of growth in general government and increased the rate of growth in higher ed and K-12. Not real radical thinking, but it started to turn this ship around a little bit, which you could see in the fact that we didn't have to raise tuition for the first time back-to-back -back years in over 30 years. So the course of the ship has turned a little bit. The other is a question of priorities. Uh, within current law budgeting and a four-year balanced budget law, which we're the only state in the union with a four-year balanced budget requirement, we assumed a cost of living uh, increase for educators because I-732 has never been repealed. So that was assumed in a baseline budget that was balanced for four years when we left Olympia. Then you get into the collective bargaining agreements. If we are being held in contempt of court for not funding basic ed as nine justices would like, why would we fund collective bargaining agreements first and education last? That's a question I think deserves an answer. Why do they get funded first? Now, the governor agreed to binding interest arbitration with the Teamsters who represent our corrections officers. Uh, it was for everything but salaries, but submitted to arbitration and gave a 10% pay increase for the coming by any or better. Who in this room is going to see 5% or more a year the next two years? Anybody? 
Okay, well, that's. I think the collective bargaining agreements were in excess, and if we're truly in contempt of court, we should be looking at those areas that are problematic first. We have a lot of budget tools in the toolbox that we can use. Uh, the voters of this state have approved a constitutionally protected rainy day fund. Now, I would never, ever advocate that we should use it for ongoing expenses. Uh, you have to have sustainability in budgeting. What I do believe, one of the small tools in this toolbox is we have a pretty healthy forest firefighting bill from last session. Uh, you got to pay your bills. That's the one time expense that the rainy day fund was envisioned to consider is things like that that are truly one time. Now, as we go into the, the rest of the budget discussion, uh, Andy Hill, the Ways and Means Chair, sums it up like this. This budget without McClary on a difficulty scale of 1 to 10, no taxes, go home in 105 days or less, about a 2. Uh, with McClary, with no general tax increase, about a 6. Throw in 1351 and we're at 12. But clearly, uh, 1351 is wrought with problems. I'll give two examples of school districts uh, that you can probably identify with. Pullman School District has just added capacity. Their bonding capacity is at the max. They can't bond another dollar. So we would have to go to a dangerous debt level to build the facilities or fully fund local school construction from the state. Go to the opposite end of our district. Pasco is the fastest growing school district in the state. Build a new building. When you occupy it, it's already over capacity. They're above their bonding limit. So where are we going to put all these kids if we literally follow 1351? Then pose this question. Calls for somewhere close to 15,000 new teachers. Does anyone really believe there are 15,000 teachers in and around the state of Washington ready to go to work where we need them, when they need them in two to four years? You probably aren't going to get the great teacher you think your kids are going to get. Just not real likely to happen. And you pay for a lot of uh, classified increases that go with this that pay for and the local levy. One of the things that 1351 does is it certainly puts emphasis on more local levy dollars. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court told us we're too heavy on those dollars. So I think finding a reasonable solution to 1351 and the rest of the budget becomes a manageable uh, bipartisan exercise that can be done. I, I still believe, and maybe I'm an eternal sophomore, but I think the glass is half full once you decide how you're going to deal with 1351. These are, these are things that I think uh, can be solved and I'll leave it at that for my House members. Well, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it. We kind of look forward to coming up here, although I hate coming on campus and parking, as you all know. That's not one of my favorite items to do, but it is what it is. Um, I am the ranking member on health care for the House Republicans, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about health care issues just to kind of give you an idea of the width and breadth of the issues that we're going to deal with. Probably the first thing right off the bat is mental health. Um, the state has lost a uh, lawsuit brought against the state over what they call single bed certification. What that means, if a person went to the emergency room and through uh, evaluation, they found that they had behavioral health issues. And so the hospital calls around to all the place where they're looking for psychi psychiatric beds. If they can't find one, they would have called DSHS, Department of Social and Health Services, said, I can't find a bed, would you certify one? And they would. Well, they would do that, but they weren't getting care. They weren't getting treatment. And so a lawsuit brought to the, against the state, which we lost. Um, in response to that, the governor, uh, through emergency action, brought on 150 beds all on the western side of the state, and we got 10 at Eastern State. So we're short on beds in eastern Washington. We will work on that. Um, there was uh, 
there was funding for uh, 48 beds in last year's budget that we'll have to locate those beds. Uh, and hopefully some, I hope a couple of those facilities will be in eastern Washington. The other part that we're going to anticipate happening is the same issue happens in jails. People get arrested, they're evaluated, they find out they've got mental health issues, but they're not getting treated. And there's actually a pending lawsuit right now, which we probably aren't going to win either. So there's going to be a couple things that we're going to have to deal with as far as budgetary pressures uh, in the next session. One of my favorite subjects, because I've read a lot about, is marijuana. We didn't pass anything last year. It's Frankly, it's pretty wide open. And there are discrepancies um, between medical and recreational use. We've got our work cut out. We will have some guidelines and we will have some rules when we leave Olympia. Period. That's, that's going to happen. Um, we're still going to have to deal with uh, industrial hemp as a crop in our state. Industrial hemp is, is high in CBD, which is the more medicinal purpose of marijuana. It is very low in THC. But we have no way of identifying which, which is which. And that's part of the problem. Along with, I, I have a page of questions that we need to answer over that, but that just kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch. I don't, one issue that keeps coming up that we're going to have to deal with is about biosimilar interchangeables, which is a classification of a drug based on live proteins, not based on the synthetic carrier in, in pills. The drug companies consider this the next big boom in uh, drug manufacturing. Problem has been is that the FDA federally has not given guidance on this, on the issue, basically because they've had inconsistent results in clinical tests uh, that they're doing. A biological interchangeable has to be exactly the same as a synthetic. No difference, and it has to be consistent. Well, they're not getting those results, and uh, so that's been kind of the hang-up, but we're going to have to deal with that this year. Uh, in our state, we've, you, we have a generic first drug policy, but a lot of instances when a uh, company has been doing just the generics, uh, that price seems to keep rising. And now we're finding that the name brand drugs are cheaper than the generics. And so we're going to have to take a look at that, trying to make our dollars go as far as they can uh, for those people who the state provides uh, drugs for. Oh, this is a favorite one. Um, the medical school, you know, here at WSU. Um, <coughs> frankly, I'd like to take a step back and look at this a little bit broader. Um, the problem that I see is lack of residency slots. There are 1,500 current residency slots in the state of Washington, 1,400 of which are in King Pierce, Nohomish. If you look at the doctors, the way they're spread out across the counties, uh, throughout the whole state, we have a lot of areas that are being underserved. There's no doctors, there's no nurse practitioners, they've, they've got, there's very little. So in my mind, we can train more people to be doctors, but I sure don't want them going out of the state after we've invested money in training them. Those residency slots need to be here, and frankly, they need to be in the rural areas. If a doctor practices or does his residency in a rural area, for three years, 70% chance he will stay because they put down roots, they will stay in the community. That's really what we're after. And so how we get there, that's, that's going to be another issue we're going to deal with. I think we're going to have to talk some more about the all-payers database. This is really inside baseball stuff, and if you want to know about it, I will tell you about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you will have to learn, I'm telling you. <laughs> Um, but another policy change that I think is going to be helpful for uh, businesses and folks in the state is that we have a, a lot of administrative judges. Administrative judges will make rulings um, on different issues. Okay, If you have a complaint with a WAC, you can appeal that to the administrative court judge. Okay, We have found several instances, not just one, but many, 
where the judges are actually employed by the departments that they're ruling on. And I think that's a problem. One case that's been highly publicized <coughs> that you probably, if, if you pay attention, you see Office of the Insurance Commissioner, uh, who's in charge of insurance. Well, this, they've just settled that, by the way. Uh, they uh, had a settlement, private settlement with her, and she dropped her lawsuit. But she was being lobbied to rule a certain way on issues. And guess which way that was? It was never in favor of anybody who brought or had complaints against the wax, and so I think that's that's an issue we're going to have to take uh, take a look at. I think that we're always going to uh, continue to look at medi at transparency in what we do in the medical issues, trying to give uh, people more tools uh, to utilize so they can make good decisions. Um, I think another thing we're going to have to work with is the governor's innovation plan. And he, he has a big fancy name for it. But what it does is this is based on a concept where, and actually this is a, what they're, they're doing this here in Pullman. So we'll talk about Pullman. All the people and leaders on the medical field get together and they talk about some of the issues that they're having, whether it's uh, uh, behavior health chemical dependency, and they sp talk about specific people. How can we get these people plugged in to get them the help that they need, that they're entitled to, okay? And it works because it's done on a local level. Well, the governor has, is trying to take this idea statewide, and oftentimes uh, I see that as a problem because uh, many times we're going to build a bureaucracy rather than driving down to the local level where actually things can actually do good. So it's something that we're going to have to monitor and, and pay attention to uh, this year. I think I'll stop there. Uh, I, I, there's, there's many more issues that I could describe, but that just kind of gives you what goes through at least the health care committee and the budgetary implications that those bring along with it and, and some of the challenges that uh, we're looking forward to uh, come start of January. So thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, I'm going to uh, take a page out of uh, my senator's notebook and um, publicly thank Stephanie Logan. Are you still here, Stephanie, somewhere? Well, I'm going to talk about her while she's gone. Because we had her once in Olympia, and it just seems like only yesterday, but it was, there she is. <laughs> But you know what? She's she's escaping not only Pullman and Olympia, she's going to Washington, D.C. And so we're going to miss her, and I'm sure we're going to be reading about her, doing all kinds of great things. So, Stephanie, thank you for the commitment you're making to go to Washington, D.C. Appreciate it very much. So I think that's one of the... Um, great pluses that we have as elected officials is that we give young people opportunities starting at, at quite frankly at a very young age uh, 14 to 16 you can page uh, either in the senate or in the house when you get into college you can come over and do an internship strangely enough you can find yourself going to work for a senator or or a house member or for a caucus and um, it's uh, it it gives you background and experience that really you're not going to get anywhere else. Just just like when you go, I've, I've done a couple of tours of duty in Washington, D.C. myself. And I guess that's one of the reasons I'm back in the state. As I, I wasn't elected. I was working for a uh, U.S. senator. But it's um, a great opportunity, and I'm glad there are young people that want to do it. I serve on... Uh, one additional committee that wasn't mentioned in its business and financial services besides early learning and besides approps and besides rules and besides uh, ed approps and these these small these appropriation subcommittees have gone away um, but um, the speaker um, announced that we're going to have a new committee on I believe it's it's like marijuana, alcohol, and uh, because as as Representative Schmidt mentioned, there are a lot of unanswered questions, and we're we're leaving people like law enforcement and others that 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 have to deal with 
implementation and and um, and some of the other interesting impacts of legalizing marijuana bring. So again, yes, uh, you you'll have a whole committee uh, focused on that, and there will be action on some of that. Uh, business and financial services, I, I really feel at home there because I've been a business owner my, my whole life and uh, worked for business, and I'm very, very interested in the economy. I ran on that five years ago. It's still my primary issue because I think strong businesses and a strong job market and strong career opportunities uh, lead to a much healthier economy, more taxes come in, um, and then we can pay for the things that are that are also important that can't pay for themselves but end up on government's plate to pay for. And uh, higher ed, K-12, and now early learning is getting a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, there, there are people who say, well, if we do this early learning right, we can close the achievement gap, or it's been known as the opportunity gap or the achievement gap. Uh, early learning is not constitutionally mandated. It is not part of, uh, it's not yet part of public education. I mean, it's, um, so when we talk about the, it's, it's a multi-million dollar uh, approach to zero to three, age three, and it's got a couple of really, really big supporters, chairman of, the, of our appropriations committee, Ross Hunter, and chairman of the early learning committee, Ruth Kagey. Ruth Kagey introduced the bill at the end of session last year to give it some exposure, but they're coming back with that, and as a matter of fact, uh, Chair Kagey visited Pullman about a month ago and visited some of our child care centers. And um, so there's, there's going to be a big push behind it. And I don't think we really talk too much about uh, that's going to be a big piece that people want. And there really are a lot more, there are a lot of needs and there are a lot of wants. And we'll, we'll spend our time trying to figure out what we're going to fund among the needs and the wants, but that what rises to the top is what we're mandated to do by the Supreme Court and what we're mandated to do by um, by our Constitution. So um, I agree with the Senator. I think this is something, for one thing, we've got to do it. <coughs> so it's not like we can go to Olympia and not do it. We've, we've, we've got to come up with a balanced budget and we've got to fairly distribute the revenue that's coming in and I believe that'll get done I uh, on, on initiative 1351 I'm not going to ask in this room how many voted for it how many voted against it but I'll tell you I voted against it because it's a it's a multi-billion dollar program that reduces class sizes for um, uh, for all students and that does sound great it really does. I mean, I, I think it was the sexiest issue on the ballot. Everybody wants their kid to go to to be in a small classroom. I, really, I mean, some of you aren't parents, but I, I I think you can you can even appreciate that. But with that grand idea, didn't come any funding mechanism. So you you saw the the big chunk at the end that um, that we're going to have to come up with if we decide to. If we and we have to decide how we're going to handle it. Are we going to try to set it aside? Are we going to uh, send it back to the voters with the okay voters? You said you wanted this. Okay, so here's the price tag. So we'll we could send it back to the voters and ask the voters if they want to come up with the billions of dollars that um, um, because I think that's reasonable. I, it, I I don't think it's passing the buck. I voted against it. Send it back to me. I'm a voter. I'm a taxpayer, and I'll have an opportunity to vote on it just as everybody in this room is if they're a registered Washington voter. But the people did speak, and it was very, very close. I mean, early on, it had unequivocal support. But as we discussed it more in our communities, you know, if it matters to you, Republicans and Democrats alike uh, 
even our even our uh, Democrat Appropriations Chair Ross Hunter said this is just something we're not going to be able to afford to do and consider all the other things that we're being asked to do. I look forward to the budget challenge. I haven't been on the Appropriations Committee very long. I begged from the day I got there uh, to be on the Appropriations Committee because I think it's my obligation representing you to understand what's in that budget. Our, our ranking member on the Budget Committee said, Susan, settle down a little bit. You're going to have to give yourself three or four years before you even start to get your arms around what's involved in the budget. And, you know, it's so I've got two years under my belt and I still have a lot to learn. So I'm, I'll leave you with this thought. I can't see, um, I would be really sad if we rolled anything back on higher ed. I know that's a great interest to you and it's a great interest to me. And I live here in Pullman. I support this institution and I support our institutions of higher learning. I served on the higher ed committee for several years, learned a lot about, and I'm very, very proud of the um, institutions we have in our state and the commitment that the faculty and administration and, and others make to higher ed. I would be greatly disappointed if we um, if we used the higher ed piece as um, uh, as kind of like a blank check, like like we we've, we've gone to it before and we've taken uh, money out of higher ed to fund other things. I, I don't know that we won't do that, but I'm really hoping that we don't do that. We're we're I feeling some some uh, we're feeling better about funding for higher ed and especially that we haven't had a tuition increase. Senator Schessler was responsible for putting a cap on how much uh, tuition could be increased. And I, you know, I, we all supported him in that effort. And, you know, when times got tough, it kind of went the other way. So I want you to feel good despite what you may read in blogs and in columns and, and, and here on the news. We as a legislature is taking the McCleary decision very seriously. We pumped in over a billion dollars two years ago when we wrote the last biennial budget. We pumped in another 60 million when we did uh, uh, a supplemental a year ago. Uh, we are reducing class sizes where this is the, what the Supreme Court said we had to do. We are reducing class sizes where research shows that we get the biggest bang for the buck and that's the, the early years, kindergarten, first, second, third grade. We uh, are implementing all day kindergarten and we're starting with the um, high poverty schools first, but there will, over the next couple of years, all schools will have an opportunity to offer all day kindergarten. We've lengthened the school day for seventh through 12th graders. Uh, we've got a new transportation formula. So our school districts, and especially these so many rural school districts deal with uh, transportation short dollar shortages because, you know, if you're sitting in a city and you measure everything by blocks, you don't really understand country roads and uphill and downhill and, and curves and grades and things like that. We've improved that. And then we've also pumped additional money in and met the Supreme Court's requirement on what's called MSOC, which I, I, it's material supplies and operating costs. It's like keeping the lights on. So feel good, really, about the, about the um, progress that we're making in funding K-12. Thank you. Okay. So we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes for questions and answers. And let me just begin uh, two issues that didn't come up and maybe we can get short uh, responses to. One is what's the, the probability that the tuition freeze will s stay in place? And secondly, what's the probability that there'll be any kind of carbon tax that's passed and in particular as part of a grand bargain to fund education? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, tuition. Uh, I can't speak for the other body. I would say I'd give a 70-30, 60-40 chance that the Senate doesn't raise tuition in our version of the budget. And what we've learned is that anything over 5% uh, jeopardizes the viability of the GET program. And 
Freezing tuition took us from a $610 million unfunded liability to a positive balance in two years. Uh, that's good public policy no matter what your priorities are. Uh, carbon tax. Uh, slim and none and slim left town. Uh, what it is, the reality of it is, look at the median income legislative district. If you're making ninety to 105000 in a King County district, an uptick in your costs, pretty manageable. You look at a median district that's in the upper 40s in a county or legislative district. Uh, it's a big deal when your utility bill, your gasoline bill, uh, and the like goes up. And uh, some of the job creators, uh, carbon taxes, if you run a food processing plant with natural gas, good luck. It's going to be a problem. Uh, what I see are a lot of smart economic decisions that make good environmental policy. Uh, Curtis King's worked for two years to get the state ferry fleet over to uh, liquefied or compressed natural gas because it saves money, burns cleaner in the ports, and it reduces carbon, which is popular in other parts. If you go to Pasco, you look at Basin Disposal Incorporated converted a whole truck of garbage trucks to natural gas. Why did they do it? Uh, they did it because it made great economic sense for their bottom line. Uh, their customers like a clean burning garbage truck coming down the street or down the alley. Uh, and oh, by the way, it made good, good environmental sense. So I think we're going to look at those type of solutions that we get economic and environmental wins across the board uh, that will benefit all. Okay. Questions from the audience? Yeah, here. So, uh, can I up? Sure. So, I have a question about uh, vocational school. I moved to Eastern Washington. I did AmeriCorps for graduate school. I worked in Adams County. I worked on the conservation district. I know part of the issue was uh, command and control, but I looked at the livestock exclusion. I'm kind of curious about the legislator's perspective on that. But also, I know that for me, it's a modified trade school. And with wind energy, it's about sending people to vocational school. And some people to vocational school to work on these big turbines. And I feel like, when we, I feel like if we had an army of farm workers uh, as opposed to an army of scientists, it would be more fun in the fields. I'm just curious about how it's going with the, the homeless project. Well, well, I would just say, don't you think we need both? Yeah. And 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 I I've often said as I totally support STEM programs. I mean we're starting STEM real early. You're, you know you're talking about scientists and engineers, and those jobs are going wanting in this state as well. But we also have jobs going wanting that you describe, and we're having people leave the state to 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 work elsewhere. We're we're not um, growing our own. So I think we definitely want to focus, and I believe we are. I think that our um, community college system that emphasizes uh, vocational courses, second to only to Florida, uh, one of the finest community college systems in the country, and they have programs that community colleges are a little more nimble. They see what the need is. I take a look at Walla Walla Community College where they're training People in diesel mechanics, uh, they can't they can't keep people in in the uh, turbine program long enough. The companies come in and hire them before they're even done with their coursework. So, I think unless you know different, the information we get and the observation I'm making is that we're doing really a good job of paying attention and we understand. I think we have to emphasize more though uh, the importance of carpenters. Uh, electricians, plumbers, I mean, we need those people. So it isn't all about the emphasis on getting science, uh, technology, engineering, and math students going through four-year institutions and above. It's also making sure that we say it's not only okay <coughs> to be the craftsman, we need those craftsmen, and that's uh, as uh, you can be as proud to be a craftsman as you can if you're going to go, if you're going to be an engineer. 
I, can I follow up on that real sure, very yeah. quickly? Not everyone's cut out to go to college, and I think we need to realize that. Um, working in the trades is a very honorable and profitable uh, profession, and when yet when we try to put everybody round peg into a square hole, it does not work. And one child, no child left behind, doesn't really give us a lot of flexibility in that respect because not every guy, not not everyone's cut out uh, to go to a four-year institution. Let me call on my retired colleague Nick Lovert, who gets to come in sweats nowadays. <laughs> uh, thank you. We're in a shor shortage of doctors, and you've got two medical schools already. But again, you've got to take a step back. It's not just about graduating medical students. They have to have a place to practice residency. So, you, yeah, we can move ahead with the school. Sure, go ahead. But, and it takes time to build these residency programs out in, their, in the areas. Three years and a lot of times. If we don't have spots, we're going to educate them. These kids, I'm sorry, I'm old, I can call you kids. We're going to educate these kids, and they're leaving. And I don't want to invest the money if we're not going to have the spots to keep them here when we're in a doctor-poor area. I, you know, that's really how I feel about it. We've got to... In that regard, are you, are you seeing residencies in, in smaller hospitals and rural areas mm -hmm. as the primary kind of focus? Well, I think we have to, I think we have to push that in that area so they just don't stay in King Pierce and Homish. Mm -hmm. And it's not just eastern Washington. It's the peninsula. It's yeah. Skagit and Whatcom counties. It's Clark County. I mean, you take out those three counties, it's everywhere else. So how are we going to get them there? And how are we going to keep them there? How are we going to get them to practice in the areas that we really have a need? The, I think, yeah, we'll talk about the school. But to me, this is the fundamental problem that we have got to take care of. Because why, why are we going to educate these if we don't have places for them? That's a waste of taxpayer dollars in my mind if they're not staying in our state. So you, wanted a, you wanted a straight answer, Nick? I know I won't get it, but I want one. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you a straight answer because that, uh, that's who I am. Uh, I support the WCU Medical School there. And the reason why, uh, I learned a lot from the late Senator Eugene Prince. And Gene Prince always believed that the University of Washington was not nearly as committed to access as WSU and other universities. If the University of Washington was as committed to access in that medical school as they should be, we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's why I support it. As a residency program, I look at my colleague Larry Haler, uh, from the Tri-Cities serves with Susan and Joe. Uh, they have all of the medical infrastructure to expand residency in the Tri-Cities. And they look at a surrounding area of the Tri-Cities. Uh, they support a co an osteopath college in Yakima. Uh, other states have multiple medical schools. We're going to phase into this thing slowly, but I, I support it. I, I have to be straightforward. Taxes, which has to be done all in cash. And so 
so we have private citizens who are driving around with lots and lots of cash in their cars, and it's kind of taking us back to the old west, and we're waiting, we're waiting in fear of somebody being hurt or killed, and really, it's, it's worrisome, and I just wanted, I know that you guys are going to work on this issue, and I just wanted you to, to hear from somebody who lives in this community who's worried about somebody being hurt or killed. And rightfully so. Um, but this is a federal issue. This is still a Schedule One narcotic. And unless there's some action on a federal level, we've got some challenges there. But no, we're well aware of the uh, temptation, shall we say, when there's that amount of, vast amount of cash sitting around. Uh, it's, it's one of the issues we've got to work on. Let me, can I just quickly, um, the Business and Financial Services Committee on which I serve, we just had a hearing on this a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, and bankers came before us and said, you know, some of them are willing to step forward, but there needs to be legislation in place that, well, protects them, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, as Joe mentioned, it's a, there, there's a federal issue here as well. But we do have, and I can tell it's a it's a bank in Spokane. Uh, she spoke uh, to the fact that they are willing to uh, to do that, and they'll be working to be part of the banking structure once there's that approval. Savings and loans. Matt, let, let me follow up on, on Dr. Lover's comment by first saying. Uh, but let me follow up on Nick's question. Uh, uh, Mark, thanks for being so direct. I wonder if the two House members can say whether they're prepared to vote for the Baumgartner bill as it's been presented, uh, which is to do away with the 1912 restriction on, on medical schools. Are you willing to go that far in this process at this point? I haven't read the bill, okay? Because frankly, I have my hands full with House bills. Right. Uh, let me just say this. I, 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 we're going to support the – we built the building and if any in Spokane, and if anyone thought you're just going to build a building, you're not going to staff it, you're naive. It's, it's going to it, – it will take time to ramp up and to get the right – the proper people in position. But it, all I'm saying is that we've got to focus on the residency side as we're doing this or else it's, it's an exercise in futility. Agree. I mean, you want us to. You want each, you directed it to both House members, yeah. and um, I think I would be irresponsible if if I didn't say let let's look at the bill and 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 then we also need to look at it in terms of the budget. And I know it's only about a two and a half million dollar request this year. I, I say that like two and a half million dollars <laughs> isn't very much, but I mean it in the grand scheme of our budget. So, uh, and just let me say that right. The senator's right. We wouldn't be having this discussion. What if what if UW had shown as much interest in Eastern Washington last year or the year before or 10 years ago as they're showing right now? Because now they're talking about working with Gonzaga. They found a building up there that's right on the edge of uh, the campus. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, n now, now they have a, a real interest. I think that's going to benefit us. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question, right over here. I'll just defer to her. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about the transportation plan because I, the bills, that's always huge and contentious and incredibly complex. And um, I guess I just want to make some comments. So here in Pullman, um, we've been working hard on trying to envision transportation in a more modern sense and thinking of it not just as roads and trucks and cars, but um, rail lines and 
alternative forms of transportation, including buses and uh, multimodal trails. And we have an opportunity, you probably are aware, that the rail line between Pullman and Colfax um, is no longer functional because it's a culvert down. And the DOT has determined that the cost of uh, revitalizing that trail is excessive. And so the part of the um, Bob Westby's uh, work with the, the transportation rail line um, study that he's been doing is that that rail line will not be revitalized. And so we have local interest, um, significant local interest in rail banking that line and preserving it for future use either as a rail line if that becomes more viable, but in the meantime as a trail for um, recreation and for transportation. And so um, part of the transportation bill is allocation of funds to pull the line from that, that because it's high quality rail line and then use that the rail tracks to revitalize the Oaksdale line. And um, so here in Pullman, that's a real boon because then the state will pay for pulling those the, the line um, and that opens it up for rail banking. And um, I know there's been some talk, at least locally, about whether the recent Supreme Court ruling um, about rail banking and whether whether that's a viable option. Um, my understanding of that ruling does not apply to this rail banking. That the conditions for that particular lawsuit um, don't apply to this line, and so um, we believe that it, it is viable for rail banking. And so I would like to encourage you, as you think about and vote on and discuss the transportation bill, to think about it in these broadest terms and recognize that even though taxes are kind of part of that discussion, that there are economic benefits that will benefit us locally by turning that into a trail because there's been lots of rail trail success stories all over the country and in Coeur d'Alene and Palmer. And we think that Pullman can have huge economic benefits from doing something like that here. Do you want to comment? Well, so I yeah, to there wasn't really a that. question there. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Colfax would also have huge benefits. Yeah, well, Colfax and Albion and Pullman, and I mean, I know we don't care, but Moscow <laughs> and Troy and care. Kendrick. I mean, it makes if you turn that into a trail, it makes a 50-mile linear trail going from all kinds of interesting ecosystems. It would be a big enough, a long enough system to be a, a tourism destination trail and there's a huge industry for tourism people that want to go do you know do trail rides and we also think it would be a great you know way to make people stay another day come for a cougar football game come for dad's weekend stay another day and ride the trail so i think there's a lot of benefits and alpine and colfax are um, excited about this also okay unfortunately i think our time is up uh, let me thank you all for coming out to our events this semester. This is our last event of the semester. We like to finish off. This is one of our, our great events. And, uh, but we will start up again in the, in the new year. We hope to see you then. Join me now in thanking our legislators for taking time out of their busy schedule to be with us.